I'm going to be dealing with your finance. Um, that is money matters. Now, when I'm done, uh, I will take questions. A lot of times, people um, do not serve God well. They are not fully committed to God well, and it is because of their finances, the area of finance. And when you don't understand how this works, when you don't understand how, the, how God's financial plan, when you don't understand all of that, you're going to have a lot of problems with your finance. So that is the things we want to be able to clear out today. And especially because of the season we're in. First of all, the prophetic season. Jesus told us that as the days are going back, we're going to be getting um, into dark days. And those dark days are not just demonic dark days. They are days of financial darkness. That is what the Bible says. And of course, particularly if you're in Nigeria, you don't even need any prophet. You don't need anybody to tell you that we are in a turbulent financial time. Jesus was telling us in Matthew 24 that one of the things we experience is financial turbulence. If you look at what's going on now, the inflation rate in Nigeria is at an all-time high. Like I was explaining to them, I did a quick economic lesson. Um, I, I don't know if you know what economics, um, sorry, inflation is. Let me even just do a quick definition. Inflation is when the price of things are just going from one level to the next. Are you experiencing that? It's going up, it's going higher, and all of that. And normally, um, a small amount of inflation is good for the economy to rise. For the economy to be stable, 2%, 3% is okay. Because you need that for economic growth. You don't want to be selling biscuits at 10 kobo. 10 years later, you'll see selling at 10 kobo, that kind of thing. So there's an aspect of inflation that is healthy. 2%, 3%, 5%, you now say this is, is on borderline high. But Nigeria's inflation rate is at 37%. And every month, last month, it was less than that. So this month, the inflation rate is higher than it was last month. As a matter of fact, Nigeria has moved from just being having an inflation, we've moved to what is called stagflation. And we've also moved to what is called hyperinflation. Hyperinflation is when the prices of things are going so high, it's become uncontrollable. So if you go to the market in the morning to purchase an item, if you come back that same afternoon, a few hours later, the price has gone higher. And this is also due to the uh, devaluation of the Naira and all of that. There are so many factors causing all of this, right? And in the midst of that, what is the financial plan? So that's what I'm going to be taking a look at. And I expect you to write because you're going to have to um, listen to this, pay attention to it. So understanding the reason God gives you a blueprint, financial blueprint, or even blueprint for anything, is so that you can plan effectively. Understanding the economy and understanding all that is going on, the question at the back of everybody's mind is, so what should I do? When God gave Joseph, or he gave Pharaoh a dream and gave Joseph the interpretation, what he was doing was he gave Joseph and Pharaoh a 14-year blueprint. He told them for the first seven years, there will be famine. And the next seven years, sorry, the first seven years, there'll be plenty. The next seven years, there will be famine. I'm giving you a 14-year blueprint. Now, God now expects them to now sit down and have a plan. You can't just be in the air, not having any plan for your finance. So there are three things you need to understand. There are three things you need to know if you are going to do well in the area of your finance. I'm going to tell you what the three of them are. Number one is called financial knowledge. This one you can get from school, you can get from business, you can get from learning anywhere. It's called financial knowledge. That is, you can define inflation. You can define this. You know what the market price is. You've gone to business school. You've read economics. You know all of that. It is called financial knowledge. But financial knowledge alone will not help you to thrive financially. A lot of people have gone to business school, but all they have is financial knowledge. You have people who did banking and finance. You have people who did economics. You have people who have gone to all sorts of schools. But all they have is knowledge. But there's something there that is higher than knowledge. So this particular one, you get it from school. But the second level you need to be able to do well in your finance is what is called financial wisdom. 
You know these people that write think and grow rich, or they write how to be rich in three days, all of that. They are writing books. They themselves are struggling. What they have is financial knowledge. If you read all of the things they, they write, it makes a lot of sense, but they are not practical things. So beyond having financial knowledge, beyond sitting in Lagos Business School, beyond going to Harvard, beyond going to whatever, you have to have the second, which is called financial wisdom. Now, in financial wisdom, it comes from two sources. The first source comes from practical experience. As you've gained financial knowledge, you're now going to the business world and you are seeing what is going on. You now have wisdom. Okay, you know what I need to do? I need to buy spare parts. I need to do this. I need to uh, maybe uh, change the packaging, all of that. It's called wisdom. That is applied knowledge. That knowledge you've collected from the business school, you now apply it. Because if you just know it is in your head, you don't apply it, then you don't have wisdom. Wisdom has to do with application of knowledge. So it comes by application. You now say, okay, next time I shouldn't put X amount on my property. I should put 4,000 on my property, whatever. That's one source of wisdom. That one is limited because you cannot rightfully predict tomorrow. That's why there's another source of wisdom and that wisdom comes from God. So there's financial wisdom that comes because you are putting into practice, you are learning on the job. And then there's the other wisdom that comes from God. And many times that one that comes from God may not make financial wisdom to the world. Example, when God told Pharaoh and told Joseph, he told them what will happen in 14 years. Now, Pharaoh be, and Moses, Joseph began to do something. He started buying because he was led by the Spirit of God. Start buying up grain. It didn't make any sense because every other person in Egypt, they were selling their grain. But here was this guy buying grain. He was operating by another wisdom. It's called the wisdom that God can give you and expect you to put it into practice. Is that clear? So the lowest level is called financial knowledge. You know it. You know what to do. You can teach economics, but you still don't have one cover. The next level is financial wisdom. And I told you it comes from two sources. There's a first source which comes from the natural source and then the other one comes from God. Now beyond all of that, there is a third level which is called financial grace. This one only comes from God. This is the one that you're doing something and the hand of God or the blessing of God comes upon that thing and that thing is just moving well. You are selling groundnut but the hand of God is with you on that groundnut. You are selling biscuit, but the hand of God is with you on that thing. So it's called financial grace. You enlarge beyond what people can see. It is the help of God. It's called financial grace. All of these three things I said, there are ways to trigger it. But what I want to deal with now is financial wisdom. So in dealing with financial wisdom, I'm going to tell you two things. Number one, I'm going to talk to you about your financial statements. And then number two, I'm going to show you your financial status. That somebody has 50 billion in the uh, in the account does not make him a rich man. And I'll explain to you why. So I want to pick out financial wisdom. What to do with your finance. What to do with your money. Just an aspect of it. Maybe another time we're going to look at it. So now let's look at revenue generation, source of income. The first, I'm going to call it operative income. What does that mean? This is income you get because you are involved in that business. Example, can you give me an example? You are selling food. You are there on the job. You are selling food. It's called operative income. You get money by being physically and actively present. Example, you're selling cars. What you have is called operative income. In other words, you are directly involved. You are making the money because you are directly involved. You have a 9 to 5 job. It is called operative income. Or put in another way, active income. Meaning that you have to be there. You have to be actively involved before that money will come. If you don't go to work, you don't do that business, that money will not come. It is called active income. That is money that you are involved in. You are working, you are selling food, you are cleaning clothes, you are making clothes. Whatever it is, as long as you are involved, you go to work by 9 o'clock in the morning, you come back in the evening, they pay you your salary. It is called active income. Why is it called active income? You are involved in that business. You are physically there and the money is coming, level one. The second is what is called docile income. Or put in another way, passive income. This is money that you are getting, but you are not actively involved. Example, 
you put out a building and they are paying you rent. You are not informed, but money is still coming. It's called passive income. Or what else? Who can give me another example? And I want this to be as interactive as you can. Who can give me another example of a passive income? Dividend is coming in. Shares are coming in. Banks are now selling. They were authorized by, uh, mandated by um, CBN and all of that. And so they are all selling their shares. So shares are coming in. What else? Royalties. What? Mutual funds. Yes. What else? Inheritance. Yes. Inheritance. Your father died. Your uncle died. Your brother died. And money came in. You were not actively involved, but money came in. Inheritance is good, but it's limited because that money just comes in once, except it is something you'll be getting on a monthly basis. But the difference between the active income and the passive income is just how involved you are. So, for instance, you have an online book, you have an e-book, you put it up online, people are downloading the book, and you are just making money from downloading it. You've written the book once, the book is online, as people are downloading, the money is entering your account. You are not actively involved, this is passive income. Is that understood? These are the two types of income. So, any money in your pocket now is either it came by active income or by what? Passive income. Now, let me deal with number three. Let's now deal with your expenditure. The third one, your expenditure, is called optional expense. You know the meaning of optional? Optional is you can choose to spend this money. You can choose not to spend that money. This I'm talking about your expenditure now. These are things that you don't have to spend money on. Example is what? Let me help you. Holiday in France. It's optional. You won't die if you don't go. What else? Luxury good. Buying cars, these are optional. You will not die, but these are how money goes out. Another one is called non-optional expense. What does that mean? You cannot do without it. You must spend that money. Example, you have money, you don't have money. You must eat through or false. You have money, you don't have money. You must get somewhere to sleep. It's not optional. You can't do without it. You must spend money on these things. So, money comes in two aspects. Number one is what? Active income. The second one is what? Passive income. Money goes in two ways. The first one is what? Optional. That is, you don't have to. It's extra. It's extra. And the other one is what? Non-optional. You have no job. You must eat. Whether I like it or not, you must eat. Now, there's one more. It's called intangible is the intangible. These are the monies you put into the kingdom of God. Intangible expense. These are monies you put into the kingdom of God. Now, let me explain to you about why I decided to talk about income, active income, passive income, optional and non-optional. You are a poor man. Hmm? If 100% of your money comes through active income, Many times they'll say, get multiple sources of income. That's not good advice. Do you know why it's not good advice? If all your income are active income, do you realize a time will come when you are not as relevant as you are now to your organization? If you age already, as you are aging, you are becoming less relevant, especially in this age where things are moving at an astronomical pace. You that used to be the hothead, the high flyer, there are people coming out of school that are smarter than you, that are wiser than you, that will do that particular assignment for less. A lady called me from the UK. She was very upset. Why? She went for maternity leave earlier than planned. And when she went for, they pay her 10,000 pounds a month. She's in BTS. So they pay her 10,000 pounds a month. So she had early, um, what's that word? Early pregnancy, early maternity, whatever. So she went on it, and then they were like, oh my God, what are we going to do? She didn't plan it. She was, she was supposed to um, have her baby like in three months' time. So this was coming earlier. So they looked around, and they said, okay, what are her job functions? They looked at her job functions. They divided, that, they divided them among three interns. So those three people were doing the job. Guess what? They were paying them next to nothing. Those three interns were even happy to be doing the job. They were paying them next to nothing. And then this lady said three months at home and then three months for the real maternity leave. So six months. By the time she came back, she was no more needed. She was very relevant. That's why they had haunted her from her own organization. She was a hot cake. 
So they say, we're going to pay 10,000 pounds a month. Do the math. What is 10,000 pounds? Do the math. <laughs> in this exchange, that's what somebody's collecting in 30 days. But what happened to her was that that gap gave the, the organization an opportunity to say, hey, we can get this same job done cheaper and without stress. These are just interns that are doing the job. So she now took them to court and said, I said, see, every organization wants it done cheaper and faster. So no matter how relevant you think you are now, a time is coming where somebody younger than you, somebody smarter than you, somebody wiser than you, somebody with better skills will come up for that same job you're doing. And now with the introduction of AI, the way the world is changing, you know, before, when you go to, you want to, remember in the hospitals, then when you go, first thing they do is what? Consultation. Is it not true? Then you have to pay separate money for consultation, correct? I think then it was maybe two, five or something. They've not treated you, just consultation. Do you know that just that income has been taken away? Why? Google. You just type your symptom. Google will give you what is wrong with you. It will tell you the hospitals that can treat your case. It will tell you the drugs, the medication you need. It will even tell you the pharmacy that sells the medication. It will tell you what time they open and what time they close. If you type a pharmacy now on Google Map, it will tell you they are open. It will take you 15 minutes to get it. True or false? So the world is changing. So if you think because you are doing it now, example, those who are playing football, age already is a problem. Because the older you get, look at Ronaldo, was he not the best player? Now he's in uh, Qatar. Age is against him already. That he's a sharp player has no meaning. Why? He's not as relevant as he was five years ago. Music, the moment you start singing, right? If you're not very smart, remember in six months, people are coming up faster than you. So that is why if all your money is active income, you are a poor man, even if you have 50 million. Do you know why? Because... Let me try to explain this simply. Remember the, the two ways we expend money. How? Optional and what? Non-optional. See how you start making money. Remember, I've not talked of financial grace. Financial grace is one that God does. But remember, I told you there's financial knowledge, there's financial wisdom. So I'm dealing with financial wisdom. If your let me try to put this simply. If your non-option, I don't want to confuse you, so let me take it slowly. If you're non-option, what is non-option now? Money you can't do without. If your non-optional expense is higher than your active income, you're a poor man. Do you understand what I've just said? Why are you a poor man? The demand of things you cannot do without is higher. Number one. Number two, if all money you have, you are directly involved in it. The day you fall sick, the day you're no more relevant, the day something happens to you, the day they get somebody smarter than you, that's the end. And Caesar is a very mean boss. They will walk you to the board. They will use you from morning till night. The day they find somebody else. I've not seen one, one time this thing failed. I keep telling people, you see Caesar, this Caesar you are dying for. You wake up in the morning, you don't want to come, you don't want to do anything. You concentrate on Caesar from morning to night. The day they will let you go, you'll be surprised. You'll be wondering, is it not me? I've served them. I've done this. I've done. When you finish complaining, they've let you go. What should a wise man do? Don't just have multiple sources of income. Check them. If you have one active source of income, make sure you find Passive sources of income. Do you hear what I said? Let me give you an example of passive source of income. Let me not even call the figures. Okay, I can in one of them. If you buy land now, land is it active or passive income? Passive income. There's a, a piece of property we bought at 700000 Just that one. And, you know, we paid over a period of time. This was some years ago. By the time we went back to that particular property, the thing had climbed. I don't want to tell you what the figure is climbed to. That's an idea of passive income. The only problem with that one is that the day you are ready to sell the name, I might not see someone that will buy it immediately. But at least it's there. Do you understand? So it's not just about having active income. Example like John now. No matter how smart you are, no matter how whatever you are, I'm just giving an example. And all you are doing is just that your legal thing. You must be involved. Mm-mm. 
So while you are involved, God has to help you. What else can I do? That I'm not necessarily involved, but I'm generating something from that particular thing. And it's not just what you do in your head. Because you are a child of God, you have to go to God and speak to him. That's what financial grace. That's why the other wisdom, God will tell you, okay, this is what's going to happen. Remember before COVID, can you imagine if somebody has sat down with God in the secret place? And God told him, okay, you know what you're going to do? I know that you, you own a restaurant. I want you to produce masks. Just produce masks and sanitizer. Is that person already rich or not? Already rich. Because he was able to download a wisdom from God. That is the advantage you have as a child of God. You don't just take decisions in the air. You are working. You have your 9 to 5 and all of that. Remember, I'm dealing with financial wisdom, not financial knowledge. I'm not even dealing with financial grace. Financial grace is one that the hand of God comes on. And what activates financial grace is what you do for the kingdom. How you are, you remember the Bible told us, Matthew chapter 6, verse 3, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything added to you. That's financial grace. But God expects you to now come down in time and work it out. The Bible says, faith without what works is dead. So this is the works I'm telling you now. So I see a lot of people, oh, I have this business, I have that business, I have that business. When I analyze what they are doing, all of the things they are doing are all within active income. So they are poor, irrespective of how much money they have. Dan Gote, we'll use him as an example because, I mean, he's out there. All of the businesses he does, apart from the shares and all of that, shares can crash at any time. All the businesses he does, he's involved. The other man, telecoms man, what's his name? Green and white. You know, before he employs you, I don't know if he stopped it this 2024, but before he employs you, he must see you. He must see you face to face and decide whether he can work for him. It means that the day he drops, the day he sees, that business will collapse because it's all around him. And because it's active income. It's because he must be involved. That also means you are not making investments in people. That also means you don't have the resource called human resource. No matter how much money you have, if you don't have men, you are a poor man. That's why the Igbo people will say, Onyenwe go ka, I'm sorry, Onyenwe madu ka Onyenwe go. So financial wisdom is apart from investing in that business, invest in men. But when you invest in men, it's not just investing in men outwardly. Invest in men because if you invest in men just physically, say, okay, I like you, let me invest in you. If they are inside that corrupt, they will still cheat you when the time comes. Men, naturally, the Bible says, the heart of man is what? Is wicked and is deceitful. Jesus said he knows what is in men, so he didn't put his trust in any man. So one of the investments you make, apart from the fact that you have to think about the passiveness, begin to invest in men. Because if all you have is just this thing, you are counting, you have problems. Some people have children, they don't invest in their children. They are training other people, but they don't invest in their children. So when something happens, it's only you, you are the richest person in your family. You are the richest person in your church. So no other person can help you except you. That's already a flawed way of operating in your finance. Third investment you are going to make, just like I said in the morning about light, you are going to have to invest in being able to tap into the mind of God. Like I said, there is wisdom that comes from all the things we do in the natural, but there is also wisdom that God can give you that you don't get from any, uh, any source. Just like the one he gave to Jacob. Just like the one he can, you can sleep in the night and God downloads a business idea to you. You can be praying and all of a sudden God downloads a business idea to you. I showed them a video about how somebody made 24 billion in, in a few hours because God told him what to do. So immediately he did exactly what happened. The same thing that happened to Peter. God said, Jesus said, now cast throw in your net for a fish. Immediately he took that action. But it is because Peter is seeing Jesus. How about if Peter didn't see Jesus and the spirit of God is tearing his heart. Do this now. But because you have not invested in developing your spirit, man, God will be giving you wisdom. God will be giving you counsel and you can't hear. You are not able to perceive. You are not able to pick it. You don't even know when you are being cheated. You don't even know. You can't even pick when they are God is saying, don't go ahead. That is red light signal. When your spirit man is saying, mm -mm, oh, if I go ahead with this business, something is wrong. 
Sometimes you are in a business place and the season for that has ended. Long before it ends, God will talk to you. Your spirit man will pick it. But if you've not invested in your spirit man, you can't even pick those information that they are sending signals. Yourself. You can't pick it. You go and invest in the wrong thing. So the thing is, you have money, but you've not invested in your spirit man. So you become a poor man, irrespective of how much money you have. The wisdom is this, apart from financial knowledge, get financial wisdom. And I said, in dealing with your finance, your financial statement, you're going to see what? What are they? Number one, active income. Number two, what? Passive income. Then what of your expenses? Optional. And what? Non-optional. What's the equation of a man that has sustainable wealth? What's the equation in this form? What's the equation of a man that is balanced financially? Your passive income, not your active income. Your passive income should be what? Higher than your what? Optional and what? Non-optional. So that means at 80, I can decide, I'm not working again, but I want to take a holiday to where? To Belgium. I'm not working again, but I just want to buy land for the church. I'm not working again, but I want to do this. Do you understand what I mean? Mm. But what many people call wealth is they have 10 billion dollars in their account. No, that's not wealth. You're a poor man because you are involved. The day you are no more physically involved, that thing begins to go down. So, how do you have sustainable income? Whether the economy is going up, the economy is going down. It is by that thing I mentioned. It's called kingdom investment. If you invest with God, if you partner with God, whatever happens to the economy that doesn't concern you because you've plugged into a spiritual economy you've plugged into the kingdom economy you've plugged into that scripture Matthew chapter 6 verse 3 where the Bible says seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and every other thing you need will be added if you do all the other ones it's good though but if you're talking about sustainability come rain come shine. Let the heavens come up. Let the heavens go down. There are people that will never go down. Why? They focus on Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. That's what we're talking about. Financial grace. Is that okay? Alright. Let me quickly take uh, let me take questions if there are. One more thing about business. Many people in the business they are doing in active income. They are making money but they are not making profit. Do you know the difference between the two? You can be making money but you are not making profit. That's in your active income. You are counting the money. Like this would that sell supermarket. They are not making profit, but they are making money. So every day you are counting the money. But the truth is, of the matter is that you are selling at a profit of one naira, two naira, three naira. By the time you calculate all the profit together, you've not put into consideration the cost of light. You've not put into consideration the cost of the building. You've not put into consideration so many things. By the time you want to pay your rent, you find out that you don't have money to pay the rent. So you are making money, you are not making profit. You better know the difference. Thank you very much, ma. Um, my question is based on that scripture, Matthew 6, 33. And um, it's based on an understanding that I think I got from scriptures or a wisdom I think I got from scriptures. Um, um, so the question is very straight. Is it, is it okay not ask God for those other things that everything I'm asking God for are um, the real things, the things about the kingdom, and then I believe that without asking God for all these other things, even though I see that I physically need them, um, I believe that they will be provided. So is it okay not to add, I mean, in all my prayers, all my life, not to ask because it's one of the things I'm actually struggling with. Okay, so before Matthew 6, 33, there's a statement Jesus made. He said, your father knows that you need all these things. Is there? The answer is in verse 32, Matthew 6, 32. He said, don't worry about what to eat, what to drink, what to blah, blah, blah. He said, your heavenly father, he knows. See what he says. The things you don't, you don't even know what you need. You think you do, you don't. But see what he said. Wherefore, if God so clothed the field, do the field, the, the grass, do they pray to God to provide? No. And then he now goes to the next verse, verse 31. He said, wherefore, if, they said, therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we be clothed with? 32. He said, for after all this into the Gentiles seek after, for your heavenly father knows you have need of all these things. Verse 33. But, the reason he said but, he's telling you that 
God knows every single thing you need from beginning to end. He says so, but concentrate on these things. But I want to put an addendum there. Now, there are people that are not asking for this thing, but their hearts are lost in after it. So because they sat in a meeting like this, they say, okay, they say we should not ask. Their heart, their whole heart is pulled in that direction, but they may never pray it out. You see, not participate in this scripture. God wants your spirit, your soul, your body in the pursuit of the advancement of his kingdom. There is division of labor in this thing. God has the part he plays. You have the part you play. Your own part is advance his kingdom. His own part is to do all your provision. Is that, does that answer your question? Plus, even if there is need for any of those things, as you pray in the spirit, that is taken care of. Thank you, Ma. My question is about giving to, to the kingdom. Which is better? Is it better to have a consistent method of giving back or partnering with some of Kingdom advance, Advancement Project or to be prompted? Because sometimes you just see that you already have some laid and things that you do, but your spirit will be directing you. Both. Both. You have the one because if you don't have a system, many months you go without giving. So you have already a system you're working with. Every month, I give God this. Every month, I do this. However, God can interrupt that and say, this month, give this as led by the Spirit. Many, many, many years ago, I'll come to church. I won't have money for offering. This is maybe 15 more, more years ago. I won't have money. And then one day, the Lord scolded me. He said, you plan for everything apart from your offering. Have a plan. Every day I come to church, I'll give X amount. 100 naira. I started with 100 naira. I was giving it every time. The next year I moved up to 200. Like that, like that, like that. I have a consistent plan. However, you can be prompted. Oh, do this. Do this. Beyond what you're already working with. So both of them work. Praise the Lord. Apart from investing in your children, how can you invest in men? Apart from investing, that same way you're investing in, you help people. You train people. You are considerate about people. You pour into men. The Bible says the measure you give, that, that scripture, Luke chapter 6, it said, give and shall be given unto you a good measure, pray and shake it together, shall men give unto your bosom. So as you are investing in men in terms of raising them, training them, pouring into men, a lot of times, it might not even be the people you directly gave that will give you back. It might be other people. But apart from that, get people you are pouring into. Get people you are discipling. Get people that you are interested in their spiritual growth. And even in their business growth. I mean, if you have a business, eh, there are some people that are not doing anything. Take an interest in them. Especially in this generation, people are wild. They are not thinking about tomorrow. They, what are you doing? What do you do for a living? What is your plan? Give counsel. Give advice. Take somebody under your wing and begin to disciple that person. Begin to raise that person. Begin to pour into that person. That's how you invest in men. Teach him the ways of God. Teach him, help him look into his life and help him grow as a Christian and help him grow as a financially responsible human being. Okay. Praise God. I just want to know, in the United States, we have uh, John D. Rockefeller, uh, Baldwin and Daddy Carnegie. They have percent that, that have survived for over 100 years. And if you, if you look at it now, John D. Rockefeller died 85 years ago. And these are the foundations of the business people. He established the uh, standard before it changed to mobile. But in Africa, business rarely survived after the demise of the owner. But we have few more, like I could remember from Amkwe Mibada. So we have someone like uh, Raymond Zad that took up the, uh, the business of his father. Zizad, they came to Ibada, 1938. And the business to drive to today. We have Odu, Odu Latte, who founded Alabuku Powder, 1918. And this business is still driving with his children. We have uh, one, uh, Jim Odutola. All these are people that have, the business that survived, so survived after the death of the owner. But to me, I'm not looking, is it only the, uh, the buying grace or we still have other requirement for a business to survive? Because some of them are, some, some of these people don't know Christ. Like Jim Odutola, Odulate. They are not Christian. Yes, and that's I don't why. know why they are, they are this thing applied to them. Simply because they are, some of them are Muslim or in other religion. Mm -hmm. I want to know, apart from uh, God's grace, mm -hmm. they, does it mean anything naturally you can do that God will support you? So, of, you know. 
so that we are fast. So there's, I mentioned there's financial um, knowledge. I said there's financial wisdom. And financial wisdom comes from two sources, right? There is one that if you put systems, there are systems that if you put in place, that business is going to thrive, whether or not they are Christians. If you follow those principles, you follow those systems, the Bible says, for instance, he said, have you seen a man diligent in his ways? He said he's going to stand before kings. The Bible says a lazy man is going to be poor. He didn't say if you're a Christian. These are principles that work. Whether you are a Christian or you're not a Christian, they would work. Now, for Africa, because of how Africa is structured, it's a bit, it's tougher a little bit to do business here in Africa more than because the, the government is not supporting you. They are taxing you like multiple times and all of that. So it's tougher here. But that doesn't mean, just like you said, there are these businesses that have survived over a period of time. If you go and look at it, they know exactly what they are doing. From day one, they start grooming the next generation for success. Another thing you see is that the average Nigerian person, the moment he makes his first five million, the first thing he'll do is go and buy a car. He has to prove that levels have changed. But you see a Chinese man that is very rich, you'll be surprised. He'll be wearing slippers, flat slippers, wearing t-shirt and jeans. But he's a very rich man. So Nigerians are very ostentatious by nature. Look at Max Zuckerberg. He said he doesn't have time to be changing shirt up and down. So he just well, every time you see him, he's wearing the exact same thing. So but Nigeria, because of how an Africa, because of how ostentatious they are, the, the moment their income rises, they buy a car, they buy a big house. So the money they're supposed to use to reinvest, they use it and spend it on things that are not necessary and all of that. So if you put structures in place, you are a Christian or not a Christian, the only thing that if you are not a Christian, the day Satan remembers you, you are in trouble. Does that help? Okay.